The other thing about the voice of the religious is that it inhibits. They tell him to be quiet. Mary rebuked him and said to him, be quiet, Mark 10, 48. Someone else said, Thomas Watson said, how can Christ be in the heart when the devil has taken possession of the tongue? See, the word religion means to bind, and not in a good way. It means to tie up, to fetter. And religious voices are always binding others. They will always inhibit. They'll always say, be quiet. That's out of order. That's not right. You know, I'm, I'm really confident that God can handle a mess in, in church. I'm really confident that God can handle a time when when there's weeping or laughter or or whatever else there is because he created these things. I'm more than confident that God is able to, to deal with things in our lives if we just allow him and not restrict him. A number of years ago, I was racking my brains to remember where we were, but our children were very young and we, we must have been on holiday because we, we found a church and uh, I th- it could have well been an Elim uh, church plant. I don't remember where it was, but I remember the service. So you must know something really significant happened in that church service. Have you ever been in a church service? You think, I'll never forget that. Yes, I was, but this was for all the wrong reasons. Because we, we were meeting in sort of a, a, a summer house, almost like a cons- big conservatory on the back of, uh, of, the, um, uh, of a house. And uh, there were only like three, three chairs in a row, and they only went back about ten rows to squeeze everyone in. And uh, we were sitting quite near the front. And the preacher got up, and he was sharing, and he was doing what he would do. And then I observed on the front row, just in front of me to my left... Uh, there was a rather, you know, to-do looking lady. Everything was in place and she was next to her husband and she looked at her watch and was, ahem. Now you need to understand that in a small little environment like that, ahem can be heard. But to his credit, he carried on because what he was saying was actually quite good. And then she went into, she had sort of a, a, a I do remember her, bless her. She had a, a, a jacket on, you know, a very stylish thing. And, sh- and she reached down into the coat pocket of her jacket and she started jingling what I can only assume was her offering. But loudly. And the more he tried to ignore her, the louder she got. And so he preached a little louder and she got louder till eventually she's shaking her jacket like this and going, (coughs) and I leaned over to Barbie as quietly as I could and I said, if she doesn't put a sock in it, I'm going to put a sock in it for her. Turned out, I haven't always been a pastor. Turned out, that she was the deacon's wife. And she would decide when it was time to end the sermon. Ah. Oh, you met one of those, one or two of those, have you? Ah. The voice of the religious will inhibit. Because we'll say, actually, we need to be tidy, we need to be nice. Who's to say that the Holy Spirit isn't going to visit us in such a way tonight that we're here at midnight? Oh dear, no, we don't. Please, Keith, no. You know, X Factor results. <laughs> you haven't heard of Sky Plus. See, for us who want Jesus and more of his spirit, we will look beyond what is convenient because our conviction is we need him. And he looks for us in the deepest recesses of our hearts to ask, what do we want? And we'll come to that in a second. The voice of the religious is duplicitous. There's a good word, isn't it? It's duplicitous. In Mark chapter 10, verse 49, they say to him, after Jesus has called him, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Now, if somebody, and I have to say, we might need to edit this message slightly before it goes on the internet. But if somebody two minutes before has made my life a misery has pawned scorn on me and rebuked me, then has the audacity to come up to me and say, cheer up! Well, I would love to give them the right boot of fellowship. Or the right hand of fellowship, 
hard, fast, and continuously. Because there is something that would rise up within me. Because it's like, you are my problem. It's not Jesus who is my problem. It's you. And that actually can be a very honest comment in church. Because most people don't reject Jesus. They reject the people in church. We end up rejecting the religious people. We end up rejecting church because we end up saying, I trusted someone once and they did this. I shared my feelings with someone once and they betrayed me. See, the voice of the religious is duplicitous. They will say one thing and then another because they want to be shown where we're the ones with the favor. They're looking to show that they're the true servants of God. Now understand this, when Jesus calls out our name, it should bring joy. When he answers our prayer, it should bring joy. But religious people, if they don't oppose what's going on, they want to take credit for it. Have you ever had someone take credit for something? Now, it's very difficult, and you shouldn't take credit for something that's God. But let me tell you a story. I feel like Max Bygraves. Oh, that's Tommy Cooper. (laughs) I can laugh like Scooby-Doo, but that's another matter. I'm not doing that tonight. Let me tell you a story. I went to work for a company in South Africa who were a personnel agency. I was a personnel recruitment officer. It's basically a sales position. And they said to me in my induction, which lasted about half an hour on the first day, they said, if you come up with any ideas, the branch gets some kudos. If it's never been thought of before in the company, you get some kudos for it. I was like... Wow, really? And the branch, you know, you'll get a um, a voucher to some fancy restaurant or something to take out your your significant other. And the branch, we get a magnum of champagne to share. So if there's anything you think of, you know, and I'm thinking, wow, all right, that's, that's a great incentive. You know, I'm listening to all this. First hour on the job, I look at the way the CVs are laid out, the what we send to the company. And what was on the back of the CV was a little paragraph from the recruitment consultant, their comment saying, this is why you should see this person. Now, I'm going back 20 years or or more now, so it's not done this way anymore. But this is why you should see this person. And so I went to the person who's just done my induction training and said, I've got an idea. And he said, you've only been here an hour. I said, "You, you let me loose on ideas. I'll have them all day. I said, why don't we put those comments on the very front page a front cover sheet, front page, so that when they get that CV, they actually pick that and say, that's why I need to interview this person before they've even opened it. Why don't we do that? Oh, that's a good idea. So it goes off to the head office, right? So everyone's like, ooh, we've had an idea. I didn't know it was the first one in 20 years, but they've had an idea. Week later, communication comes from our head office. Brilliant idea. We're implementing it across the whole Um, company across the country, across our 200 branches. Brilliant idea. However, we're not giving you the champagne and we're not giving you the meal voucher. Because the MD of the company was on a conference that same week in America and heard the same thing taught and said in America. And so we're giving the champagne and the meal voucher to him. I know. I know. Everybody was livid. Mainly because they probably wanted the champagne. So there's always going to be someone that will try and take credit for something because they feel they're the ones that hold the rights to it. But we can't take credit for a move of God. We don't hold the rights to it. And so I'd like to say to us tonight that we need to lay aside religious thoughts and think more about the voice of the desperate.